Well, welcome. Okay, today we are talking about oneness and duality, which religious science minister Margaret Stortz has called the most important question in metaphysics. This is important stuff. But before we get to that, because it's Father's Day and because I'm me, I have to give you some history of Father's Day. <laughs> Which I'm suspecting is the reason most of you came. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not calling it trivia because that makes it sound somewhat trivial. But Father's Day. This is what we found out about Father's Day. There is one particularly cool fact. And I almost thought of just not even going here because I do want to talk about oneness and duality. But there was one such cool fact that I just had to share the whole thing. Okay. So Father's Day originated in 1910. It's like, what are you people doing? Father's Day originated in 1910 in Spokane, Washington, when Sonora Dodd honored her father, a widowed Civil War veteran who raised his six children as a single dad. That's pretty cool stuff. In 1916, Woodrow Wilson approved the idea of an annual Father's Day, an idea which has worked out lots better than, let's say, the League of Nations. <laughs> I'm just saying. In 1924, Calvin Coolidge made Father's Day an annual, a national event. Lyndon Johnson designated the third Sunday of every month, of every June as Father's Day. Father's Day is the fifth most popular card-sending holiday. What is the most favorite Father's Day present? Anyone? Uh, Who said tie? I did. Necktie. Yes, yes. A necktie is far and away the most popular Father's Day gift. What are the next two? Drills and building supplies. Catherine, you are so close. Hammers. Hammers. <laughs> Hammers and golf clubs. My father-in-law is a brick mason and a carpenter. Every year, Nick wants to give him a hammer. This guy has more hammers <laughs> than <laughs> Home Depot. Oh, okay, hammers. Okay, the official flower of Friday today is a rose, but Linda and I like carnations, so we're going with carnations. Uh, let's see. Here are some interesting facts. This is the cool fact. Halsey Taylor invented the drinking fountain as a tribute to his father who died of typhoid fever after drinking from a contaminated public water source. Who wow. knew this? Aren't we all going to think of that every time we see a water fountain? Yes. A. A. Milne created Winnie the Pooh for his son Christopher Robin, and Stevie Wonder wrote the song Isn't She Lovely on behalf of his new newborn daughter Aisha. This is cool stuff. Okay. One last note, if you want good gifts on Father's Day, it's better to have daughters than sons. Women spend, I'm just saying, this is on the internet, so it's true. Abraham Lincoln said, believe everything you see on the internet. Women spend about 50% more on Father's Day gifts than men. Interesting stuff. Come back on our next holiday and I'll have a more interesting history for you. Okay, so today we are talking about oneness and duality. Okay. Here is my premise, and I want you to think about this, and I want you to sit in the energy of this. I am not you, but I also am not other than you. Think about this. I am not you, but I am not other than you. So how does that make you feel? Does that make you feel a little confused? Does it make you feel a little uncomfortable? Does it make you feel a little out of sorts? It did all that for me. I am not you, but I am not other than you. If I am not you, how can I be anything but other than you? We have you and we have other than you. How can you be anything but other than me? How can you be anything but other than me? Are we limited to a world in which there is just me and otherness, or just you and otherness? It seems that we are not. We have just walked into the world of non-duality. And we may feel as we enter that world that we are walking through the looking glass where our old paradigms no longer apply. It may make us uncomfortable. In this new world, really, the only thing we can do is just stretch our vision to try to comprehend things which it is so hard to wrap our minds around, but that we know on a soul level to be the truth. When we contemplate the notion of oneness, what do we look for first? We look for that operating principle that is big enough, that is enough to just hold all of it. We look for that operating principle that holds me and holds you and holds all the sameness, the, the creative energy, the one mind that just encapsulates 
all of us, all the wonderful diversity in our world. That operating principle is what we call source. It's what we call God, Yahweh, Atman, Baha'u'llah, all those wonderful names that Leanne sang in her song, One Power. That is the operating principle that is enough to contain and organize and create and animate all of it. That is what we believe is God, by whatever name called. So what does that require us to do? That requires us to move beyond the image of God as a grumpy old man on a cloud, or even a loving old man on a cloud, or a loving old person on a cloud. We move beyond the image of God as a separate being to whom we pray, we supplicate, we, we try to please, we do all those things which move us from the naughtiness list to the nice list. We move beyond the image of God as Santa Claus on a cloud. Our understanding expands to reflect a world, as Charles Fillmore wrote, where God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Imagine that. God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Does that give you an idea? Remember when we were kids, people used to say, oh, think of infinity. Think of the idea of infinity. And we're all like, no, I'd rather just go play. It's kind of like that. Our minds, our minds, we just see through a glass darkly. Isn't that what, what the Christian scripture says? It's hard for us to comprehend. But that is the majesty. That is the oneness that we approach. When it's all God, we no longer get to focus on that easy to understand being on a cloud. We realize instead that we are in a divine dance with all of humanity, with all of creation. So back to what religious science minister Margaret Stort said, quote, the idea of oneness with God is the most important principle in all of the science of mind. In fact, in all of metaphysics. It's all God. It is. And this is what we believe, and it's so easy to say it, but it's so much harder to live it and to know it, to make the journey, I always say, the longest journey there is from here to here, to know that it's all God. This is a world in which there is no other, isn't it? It's a world in which there's no there there. As one of my favorite writers, Christian mystic Richard Rohr says, there's no there. It's only here and it's only spirit. In all the millions of manifestations, in which spirit appears. All of us, all of creation, all of being, all of everything is a manifestation of the one. That is a mind-blowing concept, isn't it, as we sit here and we just try to grasp it. It is, a, it is a notion which just blows up my brain. All of it is just the one. Although in physical reality, when we may appear to be separate beings, we know that that is only appearance. So. Our experience here on this physical plane teaches us that there are stages to our spiritual growth. In our first phase, our youth, we live in the ego. We make our mark. We move ahead. We differentiate ourselves. We try to succeed. We show people who we are. We're better than them. We're smarter. We're more educated. We are more in whatever way we choose to be more. That's what we do in our young days when we are coming up, when we are seeking to find who we are as separate beings on this planet. That's especially true here in the West, in the United States, in Europe, where we are autonomous. We are a nation of cowboys, aren't we? I mean, we take our individual liberty as a sacred God-given right, and don't you tread on me. That's what we are. That's what we think. That may not be the vision of the future, but that is a history from which we come. We live in a zero-sum world, where if you have a lot, it means I don't have it. You have money, it means I don't. You're the 1%, it means I'm the 99%. That is the very essence of dualistic thinking. If I am good, I am always on the lookout for what is bad, because that's how I define myself as good, right? You can't have both. Remember when we were kids and we had teeter-totters? Who remembers teeter-totters? Okay, so you're up, and it's fine as long as there's something on either end. You know, you're on your teeter-totter, and the little, little girl's on the other teeter-totter. And don't you all remember the day when she said, I'm getting off. <laughs> I'm like, this is going to hurt. And then, wham, she gets off. You've got to have both balancing ends for a world of duality. You can't live in the mystery. You can't live in the confusion. 
Oneness is not like that. In later stages, back to stages of life, as we grow, or dare I say, as we age, okay, I'm saying that. We turn within, and we ask ourselves what it all means. We start to, you know, get toward the end of life, and we start to say, what is it all for? What does it all mean? Instead of looking at ways that we distinguish ourselves, we look at ways in which we are the same. We look at ways in which we have commonalities, in which we can grow together, in which we can share, and in which we can be community. We look for similarities. We look for the oneness in all of us. As writer Aldous Huxley wrote, there comes a time when one asks, even of Shakespeare, even of Beethoven, is this all there is? Is this all? We suspect there is more. When we go into the silence, when we meditate, when we engage in contemplative centering prayer, we know there is all. We know there's all. And so we search. And it's that search that got many of us here as we continue to look. We search for a means to participate in something bigger than ourselves, something greater than ourselves. As long as we focus on our distinct identity, our personhood, our attributes, our gifts, we limit ourselves to a world that is bounded by our personhood. Do you see what I mean? As long as we are focusing on our own self, we are limiting ourselves. Even in our spiritual journey, when we say, I have a spiritual experience, I am on my spiritual path. I'm still limiting it to me. I may be comparing my spiritual journey to yours. I may have read more books. Oh my gosh, she's so much more spiritual than I am. Do I feel bad today? You know, I just need to go and like retreat or meditate or you know, gaze at the stars or do something because I'm not as spiritual as she is or he is. That again is back to that zero-sum thinking. No matter how skilled, educated, successful, rich, thin, beautiful, we become. We are still bounded by that notion, those artificial boundaries of separation, of personhood, and ultimately of aloneness. Because as long as we go that way, we are always traveling alone, even if, with, even if we do it in a crowd with others. That's the very definition of dualistic thinking. This is also a world that promotes expectations. It promotes anxiety. It promotes fear of failure. I can only be so spiritual, so beautiful, so educated, so rich, until, God forbid, I come across someone else who is more. How? That's not good, because I've worked so hard to get there, yet this person is more rich, this person is more beautiful, this person is more whatever. That is a setup for failure. The expectations we have placed upon ourselves will not survive in a system of oneness, in a system of non-duality. If we live in a world that insists upon a dual view, operating opposites, we have created what Cynthia Bourgeau calls the self-other polarity. The self-other polarity. And we are like hamsters on a wheel. We're always running, but we're not making a whole heck of a lot of progress. So how do we jump off this wheel? Well, we do what we do here. We work on our spiritual practices, whatever our faith tradition, whatever our practices. And this is why we spend so much time working on developing spiritual practices that resonate with us. We work on our spiritual practices that enable us to move beyond that notion of ourselves. Buddhism, which is a profoundly non-dual faith tradition, calls this process of awakening dying to self. Have you heard that dying to self? Now this sounds pretty serious. Whenever you throw the word dying there, it's not good. But when that sounds pretty serious, especially for those of us here in the West, what it really means is that we realize the being that we perceive as our separate self is an illusion. His Holiness the Dalai Lama goes so far in his book, How to Practice, he goes so far as to teach that our individuality is an illusion. It is just not true. And it's the product of ignorance, which leads to suffering. Do you see how that hamster wheel works? As long as we consider that we are separate, we need to create expectations, we need to meet those expectations, we become attached to those expectations, those expectations ultimately do not get fulfilled, and we're back to ground one. We're starting again on that hamster wheel. What we do as we awaken is we open our eyes to see that we are part of a greater harmony. We are part of a greater oneness that drives everything. And we are simply part of this dance. This is not a source of despair. This is a sort of source of peace. 
It's a source of knowing that we are coming home because that's where we come from. It is the peace of coming home. Now, we have guides in our different faith traditions which, which we may already be familiar. The Christian scriptures are full of references to the oneness of all creation. They really are, which I thought was way cool. They are full of references to oneness as opposed to duality. In Psalm 139, the author writes of God, If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. So what is the author saying here? The author is saying that wherever you can be, heaven or Sheol, which in the, in the King James Version was translated into hell, that's really not what they meant. It's the realm of the dead. But what the author is saying is wherever you are, hell or heaven, the realm of the dead, the realm of the living, God is there. So what does that mean? It means that we are beloved. Whether we are good or bad, whatever we have done, however we have conducted our lives, everyone. We are beloved of the universe. God is omnipresent. In Matthew 5, beginning at verse 43, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his Son to rise upon the good and upon the evil, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Okay, here's the thing about reading the Bible. Sometimes we just kind of zoom past this stuff, and we, and we have an understanding of what we have been told it means. So what have we been told that means? That it's an injunction to be kind, right? That it's an injunction to treat everybody the same, and just to be nice to everybody. But it is a powerful statement of oneness. Jesus is stating the old law, the old dualistic law. Love your enemy, hate your neighbor. He then went on to say, but I say to you, a new way of looking at it, teaching the new lesson that we are all beloved. All receive God's abundance, the rain, righteous or not, good or evil, however we in our human selves look at them. We are all beneficiaries of the same divine abundance. So, if you're like me, this is a difficult lesson to learn. As we go through the vicissitudes of life, isn't it tough to love your enemy? To forgive and release and drop that resentment that we feel toward people who have displeased us, who have hurt us. Well, that's why our spiritual journeys are so important. It is a tough road and it is heavy sledding. But that is why we must do, as Reverend Sidney taught us back on May 29th in her talk, we retrain our minds to see the world through the view of oneness. That is an image I love. We retrain our minds to see the world through the eyes of the one. We no longer see good or evil, friend or enemy. Looking through the eyes of the one, we see it differently. We see all as beloved. Because that is the way spirit sees. Now let me draw a distinction here. We're not saying that as I sit here, Melanie, I look out and I see everybody all connected. Because being connected is not the same as being one. Parts of a machine are connected, but they're, they're still separate parts. When I look out in my own humanness and I say, oh, we're all connected, that's very sweet. But that is very different than digging deep enough and awakening enough to look out through the eyes of pure love, the eyes of the one. Do you see the distinction? I no longer look out as me. I look out from my heart space. I look out from the source that is within me. That is the, that is the challenge to which we are all working. To look out and instead of trying to just be nice to the world and say, oh, isn't it great, we're all connected? We look out and we see all of beloved creation through the eyes of the source that made it. It is a profoundly transformational change in the way we encounter ourselves, in the way we encounter our lives. So, non-duality, looking out through the eyes of the one, does not eliminate differences, but what does it do? It transcends them. It incorporates them. It forgives them. It lives with the ambiguity. It doesn't say there are no differences because we are divinely diverse. It means that 
I am the one and I transcend it. You are all of me. And so I take it all in, non-judgmentally, with equanimity, with release and with non-attachment. So this view of oneness is not limited to the Christian scriptures. Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of the founders of transcendentalism, that later became New Thought Thinking, wrote of what he called that unity, that oversoul. Isn't that a great word? That oversoul within which every man's particular being is contained and made one with all other. Recognizing the nature of physical reality in which we live, and it's called to duality, which we all experience, he wrote, we live in succession, in division, in parts, in particles. Meantime, within man is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. The act of seeing and the things seen, the seer and the spectacle, the subject and the object are one. No matter where we are in the dance, where we are in the equation, I see you, you see me. We are all of the one. And that is the vision with which we must look out into our world. So let's ask next, because we are a community that believes in practical spirituality, practical application. What does this mean as we go forward into our lives? We know that our thoughts create our reality, don't we? We know that as we think, so shall the universe produce. Our thoughts drive our actions, and they drive what manifests. So, if we believe in a world of duality, of competing and exclusive opposites, how does that translate into how we show up? How does that translate into how we appear in the world, how we interact with each other? This is way more than a philosophical question. This is a deeply important question that we need to ask ourselves every moment of every day. What do we see? Do we believe in the oneness of all creation, or do we believe in the duality that comes to us through our eyes when we see with our ego? It's a question worth asking. So as I was researching this talk, I came across a book by a lawyer, we love lawyer books, named <laughs> Sylvia Clute. Sylvia Clute is a former criminal defense attorney. Her book is called Beyond Vengeance, Beyond Duality, A Call for Compassionate Revolution. And it traces her journey from a senior <coughs> law student, believing that our system of justice was the best on the planet, which it parenthetically may be, to a disillusioned litigator who spent years litigating criminal cases, civil cases, and realizing that no matter how they are resolved, everybody who participates is ultimately a loser. I once came across a definition of a litigant as someone who gives away his bones to save his skin. I mean, literally, it's a system in which folks don't win. So what she did is she applied the concept of duality and oneness to our civic life, to our criminal justice system, to our religious institutions, to government. And she thought, how do we live if we look at wor the world truly through the eyes of divine oneness? She saw that our systems were based on a system of fear, of punishment, of control, of retribution, of equal punishment for what we consider a particular offense. There is no room for compassion, for forgiveness. Those kind of happen around the edges if the participants feel like it. But there's no room to institutionalize those virtues of the one. She raised a call for a system of what she called unitive justice, based upon a view of compassion, forgiveness, kindness, and love. What she did is she said, we can live together in community, in a world that eliminates these punitive, judgmental opposites. It does no good. It creates division. It does not heal. She was looking for a world in which there is restoration in which there is healing. She had this to say, and again, she's talking about the criminal justice system, but it's worth thinking about for other aspects of life as well. She says, punitive justice, as opposed to unitive justice, punitive justice is grounded in the belief in separation. We are fearful of those whom we see as separate or different from ourselves, and we believe our safety lies in controlling, 
or defeating those whom we fear. Now take that energy and see how it applies to your life. See how it applies to our politics. We are living that in our politics today, are we not? We see nothing but fear and differentiation and uh, us-them distinction. The eyes of the one reject that because we are all beloved and we need to look at the world through those eyes. It's so easy to view life through the filter of duality, through the filter of good, bad, friend, enemy, Christian, Muslim, American, non-American. The dualities, the opposites are innumerable and it is so easy and we are so encouraged to look at life through that filter. But we are called to transcend it. We read our mission and vision, didn't we? One world, one heart. Every time you come here, you commit to walking out that door and being that and living that. And it is serious stuff. We do it not only when we're looking at a pretty sunset. I mean, I can look at a pretty sunset and say, oh, I am the one. But how about when I look at somebody that I just can't stand? at people who have really made me mad, at people who have profoundly disappointed me or hurt me or cheated me or who knows what, who I wake up in the middle of the night worrying about them and thinking about them and thinking, God, I wish they would just go away. <laughs> that is where the challenge lies. When I can look at someone like that through the eyes of the one, have I succeeded in doing it? I think not. But that's why we are all on this journey, why we are in these human suits, why we are learning to awaken to that point. We have to get to that point where I can look at that person and I can say, I am not you, but I am not other than you. Holy moly, does that open your heart or what? That is a challenge. That's when our world will be transformed, one heart opening at a time. Every time we look at life through the eyes of the one, we each transform our circle. And when we continue to do it and when that energy spreads, our world will be transformed. But here's where it starts. Here's where it starts. Here, here, and here. When we walk out these doors. That's when our soul grows and that's how we find our way through. Plato said we are born whole, but we need each other to be complete. Never, I think, in our history has there been more of a time when we need to realize that we are all of the one, whether it comes to Earth's ecology, income distribution, criminal justice, food distribution, water distribution, it doesn't matter. Now is more the time than ever when we need to realize we are all of the one, and we need to look at each other through those eyes. When we do that, every time we do that, we will surely come closer to being one world and one heart. So let's take these thoughts.